So I'll be presenting the work which basically looks at how browser extensions can access sensitive data of a user. And this work was done in collaboration with my collaborators, Rishabh, Erlans, and Kasim. So well, malicious extensions, I think previously we have seen a lot of news articles that look into how extensions were caught stealing private user data. Um, and this has happened many times in the past. Uh, one, so before we begin, we should understand how exactly is this possible? How are, extend, how are extensions uh, able to do this? And the main reason is that of the current framework for extension website interaction allows extensions to uh, exploit and steal user data. So extensions are basically formed of two major type of script, the content script and the background script. And say you have an external server, the content script, background script can talk to each other, and the background script can talk to the external server. Uh, uh, and while the content script can send data to the external server, it cannot receive it. So how does this affect uh, a web page? Well, the content script stays in the same context as the website that you're visiting, which means Say your website has some private data like password, SSN, credit card information. The content script of the extension will have access to all these data. One more thing to note is that currently, most of the extensions that we have, uh, they follow something called manifest version 2. Now, manifest version 2 is basically the second generation of rules and regulations that extensions have to follow when interacting with websites. Now, a problem with MV2 is that MV2 allows uh, execution of remote hosted code, which means that the code that they're executing doesn't need to be in the source package itself when they upload it for review, which further means that a malicious content script can inject a malicious remote code from a server, and then they can access all the personal details of a user and they can send it to an external server. Now, recently, like uh, uh, one year ago, Google introduced a manifest version 3, which removed this remote code execution. However, MV3 has not yet been widely adopted across all browser vendors, and it is currently uh, being widely rolled out in Google Chrome itself. So this made us question that, OK, MV3 has come. It doesn't allow you to inject. Uh, remote code. So can such malicious extensions still exist? Well, unfortunately, the answer to that question is yes. Now, to find the answer to this question, we performed an experiment wherein we, ha we uploaded a proof of concept extension to the uh, Chrome web store. Now, the extension could talk to an external server. And the extension's design was that it had two parts, a benign part and uh, malicious part. Now, when the external server would send an off signal, the extension would be benign, as in it would not access private user data. But once it gets an on signal, it will access the user data and send it back to our ma malicious server. Now, this was a private extension. And when we uploaded it, this extension passed the Google review checks. And uh, so this led us to believe that well, if this extension can pass it, there are probably other malicious extensions in the web in the web store that are probably uh, you know they, uh, that have the capability to steal user data. So, to further understand the landscape of existing practices on in this given vulnerabilities, we perform two measurements. First, we look at websites and to see if they're actively protecting these password fields. And then we look at extensions to see if they are uh, actually exploiting these vulnerabilities and stealing or you know, ac um, unauthorized, performing unauthorized access to these password fields. So when we analyze the top 10,000 websites, we basically created a login page detector. We got around 8,000 websites. And when we analyzed the login pages, we found that 1,100 websites um, 
had the password that the user entered in the password field visible in plain text in their source code. And further, we found that almost all other websites uh, had the password fields value easily accessible using some JS API like you know, dot value, dot text content, something like that. So let's take a look at some examples of the plain text vulnerability, which Google has. So this is the Google login page that any one of us sees when we log in. On the left, you have the UI interface. And on the right, you have the source code that, uh, that the malicious extension has access to. So if you look carefully, in your super secret password that you have entered in the password field is visible in plain text in the source code that the extension has access to. Now let's take a look at the API vulnerability. And this exists in the IRS's check refund page. So when you are checking for your refund and you enter your SSN in the SSN field, and if there's a malicious script that has access those to, that is accessing those, uh, selecting those uh, input fields, and all it has to do is do like the dot value function, and it can get access to the SSN that you have just entered. So why does this exist? So to figure that out, we contacted Google, and we contacted our own university's IT department. And through these discussions, what we realized is the main reason for that are password managers. Now, password managers have three functionality. They can read the password that you entered and save it for later use. They suggest new passwords, and they enter the saved password. Now, not allowing password managers or extensions access to these uh, these uh, password fields or input fields would mean that this functionality of password managers does not work anymore, which would harm the usability of password managers. But um, so, so far, we have seen how websites have these vulnerabilities that can be exploited to extract user data. Let's see if extensions are actually uh, using this vulnerability or not. So, so do that, we, we went to the Chrome Web Store. We downloaded around 160,000 extension, which is pretty much the entire web store. And we analyzed the, uh, using like a set of static and dynamic analysis. What we looked for are extensions that would access the password variable. And, that, and then they would store that password value in a variable in their own source code. And we found around 190 extensions doing so. So these extensions would access the password value and save it in a uh, in some kind of variable in their source code. Now, to further understand uh, if all these 190 extensions were malicious or not, we would send them to an LLM framework that we call Extension Reviewer, which would then flag suspicious extensions. So how does this LLM framework work? Let's look in detail. So the design of the framework is pretty simple. We have the source code on which we perform context-aware splitting. And then we send it through an embedding model and store the vectors in a vector database. Now say we have a question. We would first query the embedding uh, vector database. And we would get the code chunks from that. Then we would uh, send these retrieved code chunks and the question to the LLM. The, the code chunks act as uh, like uh, additional context for the LLM to answer the question. And the LLM will give us a yes or no answer. So now that we have this, uh, now that we have this framework, we had to evaluate it. So when we, in order to evaluate it, we had to create a golden data set first. So for that, we went to GitHub, and we got a list of tutorial extensions. Now the benefit of tutorial extensions is that they have the source code as well as the, as well as the, like a readme file that has the workflow of these extension. Now the so so for, we took the source code, we minimized it to remove like comments and those kind of things. And we stored it in the vector database. And then we used the readme files to create our ground truth data set. Now that we have our golden data set, we evaluated the framework. We had an expert model that had access to this vector uh, database. And this formed our LLM framework. Then we had a person who would ask these questions to the expert model about the workings of the workflow of the extension. And then he would generate a summary, which would be compared against the ground truth that we received from the previous, uh, from the ground truth data set. 
Now, to make this more automated, we replace the human with another LLM, uh, the query model, who would ask the questions and then provide the summarization. And we saw that the generator summary and the ground truth were accurate 88.7% of the time, which means that the LLM framework is able to understand the workflow of our extension pretty well. So now that we have our extension review framework working, we gave it the 190 flagged extension as well as some questions that we had created. Now these questions were uh, designed to have like chain of thought prompting in it, wherein we would ask the LLM to give us evidence to support these answers. And using through this pipeline, we had around one. Uh, we found 12 potentially malicious extension. And example of that would be this extension called Web Search Tracker and Analyzer. So this extension advertises itself to track all your search history and so on. But in reality, it also accesses all your uh, all, all your data, uh, all your passwords and all those kind of sensitive data and sends it to an external server. So what are some of the things that we can do to ha help protect against this? Um, so we propose two solutions. One is the Bolton solution, wherein we, in, uh, we create a new uh, JavaScript class using weak maps that emulate private variables. So it's very simple. Say the top, the top password field is unprotected, whereas the bottom one is protected. So if a malicious extension tries to access it, they can do it with the vulnerabilities we saw before. However, with the protected one, because it has private variables and it uh, projects a masked value, the extension is unable to find that. Now the second solution was the built-in solution, wherein we propose that there should be a complete revamp of the current browser architecture, as in there should be an additional layer of protection so that any access to these kind of sensitive data is just uh, prohibited at the OS level or like at the browser level. Uh, uh, impact of our research was that it was picked up by top news outlets and uh, like Malwarebytes and TechRadar and ending the talk on a positive note that since our research we have seen that IRS has updated their website to no longer have that SSN vulnerability. Uh, thank you. Take questions. <laughs>